I want to welcome you. This is a Penn State intercrop cedar demo here. My name is Chris Hauser. This is Corey Dillon. Uh, we're in about our third year of research with this piece of machinery. Uh, one of the reasons that we're trying to interseed cover crops is uh, we found that we had a difficulty getting cover crops established in corn for grain, and this is one way of, of getting past that hurdle. So we're going to talk about this machine. This is our typical Pennsylvania cornfield in the fall where we have no cover crop and we hope to, our goal here is to establish something. So, so we know at this time of year, in addition to the weather turning foul, the harvest, several other factors of just timing, it's hard to get a cover crop established uh, when this corn's ready to come off for grain. So that's actually what drove the invention of, of this machine here, to try to move that window from a fall planting to a midsummer, or kind of early summer planting to give the cover crops a chance to get going rather than trying to get them going in late November, even in December. So here's a picture of what this machine's capable of and what we hope to achieve. This is some uh, clover that was planted in June when the corn's roughly this high. And, uh, you know, for every thousand pound of this, we can get grow about 40 pound of nitrogen. So this, this was actually taken in our first year of research. It was actually just across the highway, uh, Route 45 here. Um, and we used a red clover species here by itself, uh, interceded at about 10 pounds per acre. We had no idea how things were going to work out at that point, but uh, as it turns out, uh, come this time of year, at Ag Progress Days in 2010, we started looking at the plots, and we started to see a pretty good stand, so it was encouraging that we were maybe headed, you know, in something in the right direction. So here's a picture. Uh, we're doing research mostly all over the state of Pennsylvania, and here's a picture about 20 miles east of here on a beef farm that this farmer is uh, down, on, down along the creek bottom that he wanted to have a field interceded. Yeah, and this just shows uh, kind of the three functions of the machine that we'll talk about here in just a minute. But on this farm, we actually seeded the cover crop. It was a no-till field. Um, we applied uh, a fertilizer, a UAN fertilizer, at side dressing time. And we also applied a post-application of glyphosate across the whole field. And we have some pictures to show the results here in just a minute. So everybody's first question is, if you plant cover crop at this time of year when corn's knee high, is that going to affect our corn yields? And we have not found any uh, studies yet that we did find a yield lag in any, any yields. And the reason why is, this corn, this uh, cover crop is just getting started. It gets emerged. You have corn and it looks like that within three or four weeks after the planting. And it, it has to live in a low light, low water area, and it just sort of hangs out to when that corn senesces and starts dying down, that it can get the sunlight and the water to really grow. The second question we get from a lot of farmers as well is, how does my no-till herbicide program affect the cover crop establishment? This is actually a picture taken from our first year research in a herbicide trial that we're working on where we're looking at several different no-till corn herbicides um, applied both pre-emergence and post-emergence to see what the impact will be on the interseeded species, what programs we may be able to get away with for reduced rates, um, what's going to cause too much injury to the cover crop, and uh, that's still uh, a project that we're working on even yet this year. Um, we, we've seen a few things that keep showing up each year as a problem, but for the most part, the injury that we expected, we, we haven't seen yet, and we're, we don't know that we're confident yet to say that certain products are good or bad, but we're, we're continuing to look at that to try to make recommendations. So here's that first field that we showed you where the machine was going through, and this is the whole field done like a four acre field. So this farmer had roughly a three ton of corn stover in there and a ton of ryegrass growing in the fall. And as Chris mentioned, if, if you can kind of tell from this picture, back here along the edge is the, uh, the trout stream. So, you know, we had the ability at this farm to actually work in kind of a riparian zone 
Um, this farmer likes to apply manure to this field, so the manure is held there over the winter by the, the grasses that are in here growing. And you know what we'd expect to see this year when he went back in to plant was all that nitrogen and the manure that he had put on that field to still be there, uh, taken up by this crop and held. And you know that's like planting into uh, an old pasture, an old alfalfa field. So we would expect to see you know a little bit of a yield bump by planting back into that. So if that's a picture of what, what it looks like in November, here's a more typical picture of what we can get in the spring of the year that we would be burning down to go plant back into. This here's a, I mean, it was a nice cover crop for over the winter and it did its job. Yeah, and this is actually our herbicide study again last year. Um, this field was taken for silage. It's kind of hard to tell, but uh, it was a really wet uh, fall. So this field really got beat hard by the harvesting equipment, a lot of compaction. Um, but again, based on this picture, we've you know we've planted corn kind of in this north-south direction, and we've sprayed our herbicides across these rows. And actually, this is Dr. Greg Ross standing out in the field, but where he's standing is a herbicide treatment. I'm not sure which one it is, but it just shows that some of the products that we expect to see some injury with, we we haven't seen the injury yet. Um, but that could be a wide range of environmental factors given the crazy summers we've had the last couple of years. So one idea we come up with once we had this in the spring is, how would we go about planting back into that? And here's just a picture where we tried to stay off the off of the grass interseeded, and we tried to stay off the old corn row to go back in and replant into that neutral area in between there. And it was a decent seed bed, and we got some pretty good establishment. Yeah, in this picture, we can actually claim that we kept the field green all year long. We, we planted this corn in, in May of, of 2010. We interseeded it in June of 2010. Um, that cover crop grew all through the summer, all through the fall. And then in 2011, we came back in in May again and planted corn. And we actually planted the corn prior to burning down the cover crop. So we waited a week or so after the corn had come up to come back in and, and kill the cover crop. So we were able to keep that field green 12 months out of the year. So just to go off of that picture, this is what the corn looked like then about a month later after the corn got up and started growing. We, we were able to kill the ryegrass and have a nice uh, establishment of corn. Yeah, and actually, um, maybe some of you have concerns about annual ryegrass and controlling it. And uh, actually, we have Dr. Bill Curran here in the crowd. He's actually working on the uh, uh, protocol for terminating uh, annual ryegrass, you know, whether you're using it as an interseeder or a, a cover crop or what have you. So it's something we're, that we're looking at here at Penn State if you're using this, uh, how to keep it from becoming a, you know, a problem down the road. So here's another benefit of some of our cover crops. And this was planted uh, a year or two ago in that field that was, look, this was planted, dug up this spring actually, and it was about nine months after it was planted. And we had roots that went about four feet deep in this clo in the clover. So it really helped with breaking up some soil compaction or building some soil health. Yeah, and this is actually the field that I showed you our, uh, our herbicide study with uh, the picture with, with Dr. Roth in. Um, you know, that, that field saw a lot of abuse last year with the harvesting equipment. It, you know, it was really wet. So, uh, you know, these roots provides a, a whole new... Uh, ability to break up that compaction and you know and improve the soil structure and improve the soil health overall. So is in our economics that we have in the ag industry right now you know we, we have a shortage of forage because everyone's going to corn to some degree and this farmer here was able to put his mules out in the field in December where he was able to graze off that ton of ryegrass and also the three ton of stover that were that was there. And as you can see, uh, kind of a benefit for this farmer, in addition to the forage source that he wouldn't have that time of year for his mules. And if you look back here, typically these are the pastures that the mules were on and they're, and they're ready for a break. And uh, a little bit of a stream runs down through that ravine. So it really uh, you know, has the potential to maybe give the pastures a break at that time of year and move them out onto the crop ground. And uh, you know, in addition to the cover crop there, the, the, the mules are providing some manure. So. Uh, that cover crop should come back up and help take up some of that manure and hold it again then for the following year's corn. 
So Corey's going to talk about the individual features of uh, the inner row seater before we fire it up and pull it ahead a little bit. Yeah, and you're welcome to come up closer if you want. Um, this is actually a, a three-point hitch uh, piece of machinery. We developed it here at Penn State. We built it here in our shop. And uh, we'll just start with these two tanks. The two tanks are on there. Uh, one carries a UAN fertilizer. The other carries a solution of glyphosate. And we apply those both at the same time while we're seeding. And the way the machine works is we're, we're running a series of two inch wide wavy colders down between the middle of the rows. <coughs> That's to till up the seed bed. This machine was designed specifically for working with no-till soil. So a lot of times here in this area, uh, in the middle of the summer when we're trying to run this thing, it's starting to dry out. The soils are pretty hard. So we found that the vertical tillage gives us a nice seed bed preparation. Just behind the, ver the vertical tillage colders, we have a, a seed box here. Um, we can run a whole host of seeds through this, this box. And uh, the seeds dribbled on just behind the colders into that area that's just been freshly tilled. And then we follow that with a set of colder packer wheels that packs that seed down into the soil and incorporates it so we get good seed to soil contact. And we follow it with a drag chain that actually helps pull some of the soil over top that seed. So again, that we get good seed to soil contact and hopefully good germination. In addition to that, four inches off the row on the front of the machine, we have these injection nozzles that are putting the UAN fertilizer solution on at a pretty high uh, PSI. It's about 70 PSI. So we're, in, we're incorporating it somewhat just with injecting it. And we're also actually getting a little bit of soil thrown around from the colders. In some cases, it'll actually cover up that band. So we're hoping to, to increase the efficiency of the nitrogen by keeping it close to the row and also maybe limit the volatilization by covering it up with a little bit of soil. On the very back of the machine is our post-application herbicide. That's actually being applied with, through these drop nozzles. And the reason for the drop nozzles was if we had our nozzles up here and went across the corn now, most of the herbicide is going to end up on the corn canopy, and that's not really our intended target. So we've dropped the nozzles down below the canopy, and we worked with one of the, the spray companies to come up with the right nozzle, but the nozzle is kind of a flat fan that shoots out uh, from the center both ways 15 inches to cover that complete uh, alleyway between the corn so that we get the, the glyphosate on the target weeds as opposed to all over the, the corn uh, crop itself and, and miss the weed control that we're trying to achieve. Yeah, so with that, we'll, uh, we'll fire the machine up. We don't have a whole lot of corn to work with here. We'll just pull ahead 10 or 15 feet so you guys get an idea what it looks like running in the field. So here you're dropping the seed. Here we have a yellow tree. You can see it better. Here's gray and how it's down under the corn canopy. And you can't see it. You can't see it, but there's a nitrogen being applied also. And this is the typical seed bed that we might have heading down through the corn row.